Vikings Valhalla is a historical drama streaming on Netflix in which tensions between the Vikings and the English royals reach a bloody breaking point and the Vikings themselves clash over their conflicting Christian and pagan beliefs before setting out for revenge and glory against the English. The show depicts real historical figures and others that are adaptations of historical figures, such as the case of Jal Harkon, played by Carolyn Henderson, ruler of Kattegat, who was not only a black Viking ruler, but who also appears to be a gender-swapped version of a real historical figure, Harkon Erickson. The notion of casting actors of colour to expand and normalise diversity and inclusivity is in many ways an admirable one, but lately this trend has extended beyond context and even common sense to place inclusivity and diversity ahead of historical accuracy, ahead of audience suspension of disbelief, and ahead of any willingness to work within or accept limitations, creating a new weird relativism where we are now expected to accept that diverse actors are entitled to play completely incongruous characters, with an implication that if you're not accepting of such choices, then you're latently or openly biased and in the way of progress. Are you serious? As examples of this trend, we have, in addition to Carolyn Henderson's Jal Harkon, Jodie Turner-Smith's portrayal of the historically white Tudor queen Anne Boleyn, and, of course, the upcoming Lord of the Rings show, including a black dwarven princess, Deesa, played by Sophia Numvet, choices that have all sparked at least as much pushback and criticism as they have garnered praise as acts of boundary-pushing boldness. The point here is that inclusivity is great, but sometimes it's wise to pick your battles. If Hollywood were as open to that notion as they are to promoting identity politics, then the culture and the internet would be better for it. Vikings Valhalla begins in a Viking settlement in England. It is St. Bryce's Day, and Harald is leaving for Norway when the English king Ailred orders all Viking settlers in England to be killed, including Harald's brother Sten. King Canute, the king of Denmark, calls all Viking warriors to meet in Kattegat to form an army to exact revenge. Meanwhile, Greenlanders Leif Eriksson and Freydis travel to Kattegat through a great storm as Freyda seeks revenge on the man who raped and scarred her years earlier. She soon discovers the man responsible, Gunnar Magnusson. Later, Freyda sneaks into the Great Hall, where she kills Gunnar. Before an enraged Olaf can kill Freyda, Jarl Hakon, the ruler of Kattegat, stops him. I'm generally liberal, but I'm becoming increasingly disenchanted with some aspects of liberalism, especially when it comes to culture and entertainment. The great failure of modern liberalism is the inability to make any distinction between dynamic, grounded and relatable liberalism on the one hand, and the flaky, strident, lecturing and indulgent extremes of identity politics on the other. It is the seeming inability to make a distinction between liberalism that achieves milestones socially and culturally by bringing along the vast majority of people through mature appeal and engagement on the one hand and cultural progressivism that jarringly stamps its social agenda of diversity and inclusivity as it wishes, alienating and confounding huge numbers of people, then further antagonizing and alienating them by tarring them with the same broad brush as reactionaries, subconsciously biased, misogynistic, and unenlightened, if they complain about it. You just don't want to learn anything. You just don't want to listen to anybody. There are too many liberals who can't acknowledge or permit the idea that liberalism can be divided into those two categories. The consequence of this is that every ridiculous flare-up in the culture war has to be instinctively defended in pop culture media as a threat to liberalism as a whole, without allowing for any concession or there being any wry acknowledgement that some things do seem a little dopily contrived or lecturing or lame. The point is, inclusivity and diversity are great, but don't have to be imposed everywhere, especially in contexts where it is confounding and borderline nonsensical. There were actors and actresses of colour in Game of Thrones. This, unlike Vikings Valhalla, was a fictional world, but, like Vikings Valhalla, it was a medieval world of clans and fleets and castles and armies. The actors of colour fit in ideally, because they were depicted as coming from more arid climates, broadly evoking northern Africa or the Middle East, where contextually their ethnicity made sense and cohered. Similarly, the southern region of Dawn was also a warmer climate, though slightly lusher, and a little evocative of Spanish, Balkan, or Italian lineages, and were therefore also contextually coherent. In contrast, having a black woman featured as not merely a believable character, but as a noble woman, in a show set in the icy and windswept northern regions of Europe in the 11th century, 
is so glaringly out of place that it is actually kind of ridiculous, and there is even something slightly obnoxious about this instance of placing the values and agenda of inclusivity ahead of essential plausibility. Mm, I don't know, you can't do everything. Yeah, yeah, that's as well as being out of place, it represents Hollywood and liberalism at its most indulgent. And again, I say that as someone who was broadly liberal. It is indulgent because it imposes an ethos of identity politics that not everyone adheres to or recognizes into the middle of a production where historical accuracy should be adhered to and affirmed, not used as a basic template or as something to be dispensed with in the name of some kind of boldly assertive expression of widened boundaries or empowerment. It is indulgent because its contextual oddity undermines the show itself and establishes a kind of obtuse relativism where it's no longer clear what the rules or conventions are about who can play or not play what characters. It's indulgent because it isn't necessary to impose this kind of contextual glitch into everything. There are plenty of shows set in cities or regions or historical contexts where actors of color can shine and inhabit strong complex roles, exploring and expressing myriad motivations and speaking to important themes. And it isn't necessary to include actors who look unignorably out of place in historical contexts where there is no historical evidence of their having existed. It's indulgent because it looks weird to see the characters of 11th century Vikings or Tudor noblemen interacting with characters from our multicultural present as if transposing our multicultural present to those ancient time periods is somehow coherent, when the actual reactions of people from those times would have been perplexed or dubious or with immense ironies and bigotry. Lastly, it is indulgent because all these characters of color imposed into incongruous contexts are good guys. Powerful or navigating the higher echelons of power, morally strong, sympathetic, consequential and charismatic. It is quite clear that Hollywood is happy to indulge the inclusion of these diverse characters of color, but not to an extent that it means depicting them as villains, antagonists, unlikable or swept along by events without agency. And why not? Surely such characters are just as intriguing and challenging roles for actors of color. And surely audiences are intelligent enough to engage with such characters. Inclusivity and diversity are great, and part of an ongoing effort to promote opportunities for actors and actresses of color. But as I said, there's also nothing wrong with the idea that sometimes you should pick your battles. <laughs>